Professor uh, Mark uh, Ablowitz uh, here. Uh, the, top, the title talk is The World of Non Innovates from Beaches to Okay, Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is it okay? How's that? Is that okay? Okay? Still closer? How's that? I can look closer. Turn it towards me. That means I put a miss on the No, I don't see how. How's that? Is that okay? Yep. I'll look down. <laughs> so, uh, first let me uh, begin by thanking the organizers for, A, organizing this conference, a very lovely conference, uh, and inviting me and uh, myself to wish Yuji all the best. It's a very momentous date, which you'll forget very quickly. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, after 60 you know, years. It's, uh, it's very exciting. I'm also very happy to see many of my former colleagues, students, postdocs, and people I met many years ago, especially important to me in my trips to Japan. Very important and very formative. And I'll say a few more words about that tomorrow. But uh, today I'm going to talk about nonlinear waves. And uh, the title is A World of Not Only Waves from Beaches to Lasers. And um, one of the things about a theorist is you don't need a million dollars of equipment. You can do water waves. You don't need an ocean in front of you. You need to conceptualize it. You can do optics. Spatial optics, communications, or BEC. We need big time equipment. And the equations, the fundamental equations, are surprisingly robust in the sense that they cover many uh, areas that are disparate. And you'll see some of that today. Of course, waves are general and uh, they go back for millennia. And they've held people's fascination. And uh, <coughs> one of the things that caught my attention are these beautiful prints by Japanese artist Hakusa. And there are two of them I'll show. One is less well known than the other, the fast cargo boat battling waves, which is really my favorite. But most people know the great wave off of Kanagawa which is considered one of the most famous. This is the fast cargo boat, and I like that sort of solitary wave. And presumably fast because there are a lot of guys in the boat. The boat can contain a lot of words. The great wave of Kamigawa came later, and there's Mount Fuji. And Similar kind of structure to the boat. These guys look very funny. Okay, so the outline of the lecture. The first part will be somewhat colloquial in nature. Uh, some historical remarks, discuss solitons in a broader context. Then I'll talk about water waves and some topics in optics, communications and lasers. Well, a lot of the equations that under, underlie these topics uh, have been equations that were important for a long time. But they're variants to the equations that make them worth discussing in this somewhat different context that I will today. And conclusion. <clears throat> so waves that have been of long-standing interest are solitary waves or solitons. They're localized waves, generally not wiggly. And in math, solitons rise in equations which are nonlinear, so they're not so easy to analyze necessarily. 
localized waves are frequently interested in, of interest to people in physics because they can be observed. And these are some of the applications, water waves, communications lasers, and so on, including pure and applied mathematics. Historical timeline, the fundamental equations for invisible fluids set out by Euler in the 1750s. Wrote many books and surprisingly wrote many when he had little or no vision. And there he is. You can see his right eye. That would probably work. In 1813, the French Academy of Sciences announced a prize competition for water waves. And it was won by Cauchy, who studied the initial value problem for linear equations. Poisson was a judge of the committee. Strangely, he submitted a paper, an important paper, but Cauchy nevertheless won the prize. It was published uh, years later and closely related to work by Fourier. Probably controversial because it used Fourier methods, which weren't well known for example. Fourier, Cauchy, Poisson major names in mathematics today, but this was in the context of rulers. We move on to the 1830s, the British Association for Advancement of Science set the Committee for Waves. One of the two members was John Scott Russell, and there is an early uh, portrait of him, and he, they wrote three papers, the big one, was 1844, and he described his observations. Many of us have heard about this before. He saw a localized, smooth, well-defined heap of water set off by a barge, called it the great primary wave of translation, later known as the solitary wave. And he has that famous quote, such in the month of August was my first chance interview that singular beautiful phenomenon. He requested mathematicians study this problem, and mathematicians weren't necessarily so positive about it, notably Airy. Uh, and he did experiments to convince people that his observations were, were solid, and there you can see a solitary hump of water moving down. And there's some interaction. In 1847, Stokes worked with the water wave, nonlinear water wave equations, to found a traveling periodic wave called the Stokes water wave, where the speed and the amplitude are related. Now, actually, Russell, in one of his major discoveries, was that the solitary wave, the speed and the amplitude were related. Despite that, Stokes was rather ambivalent about uh, Russell's work at the early stages. It wasn't until much later that he generally agreed. He also made many other critical contributions to fluid dynamics, setting out, help set out the Navier-Stokes equations, as it was after. And if you have some time this afternoon, you could study the equations and maybe prove that the solute, regularized solutions exist in the equations. And for that, you'll get a million dollars. Just an afternoon's work. Well, we move to the 1870s and 18, late 1800s, where Boussinesque and Corwin and De Vries studied shallow water waves and uh, developed simplified equations because the water wave equations simplify in the shallow water, the limit of the water wave limit. And um, Corwin and De Vries also found the conoidal wave solution periodically, special case being the solution. So we would say at this stage, Russell's observations were confirmed. They developed simplified equations, equation from the water wave equations. They wrote it down. Here's their equation, which I'll talk about more later. 
This is the equivalent de Vries equation in the form that I took from the paper. And T hat here is a normalized surface tension, and it's typical water surface tension zero. And so they found a periodic wave and solitary wave solutions that had all the right structure that uh, Scott Russell could see. Amplitude and speed were they correctly. Between 1895 and about 1960, the main applications were waterworks. But in the 60s, new applications came about because mathematicians and physicists had developed perturbation theory. And in fact, Yuji's one of his great contributions, for sure, is using effectively perturbation theory. I don't think applied mathematicians and, and mathematicians necessarily appreciate the value of perturbation theory and, and its value in understanding uh, large and small terms. Often they worry about the rigor of the problem, but before you can be rigorous, you really have to get the right equations. And that's, of course, what Kohlberg de Vries did as the Lucidus. So uh, you get to the Kohlberg de Vries equation for many of these applications because uh, the dominant balance is the wave equation to leading order, and then it's weakly dispersive, weakly nonlinear, and you'll always get the Kohlberg de Vries equation as long as the uh, nonlinearity is correct. And here is that solitary wave solution in non-dimensional form where the amplitude and speed are related. 65 is rather momentous because Kreski and Zabuski, in a different context than water waves, studied the Fermi postulator problem. This is a lattice problem. They took the continuum limit, used the new methods of perturbation theory to get the de Vries equation, and they study, strangely enough, periodic problems. And if you look at it really carefully, you realize that the periodic problems separated into solitary waves, which had special interaction problems. And basically, soliton, the word soliton was coined because two solitary waves will interact, and their amplitudes and speeds will not be affected in the quarter of degrees equation. They coined the term solitude. But today, if you talk to 98% of the people that do physics, a solitary a soliton is a solitary wave. And the solitary wave in the sense going back to quarter of degrees and Boussinets, uh, not in the context of solitude. Zabuski, which led to the whole field of integral systems. In a meeting like this, we know the difference, and despite the fact that I know the difference, just from the fact that I go to physics meetings frequently, I just use the word solitude, knowing that it's a solitary motion. But most of the time, solitude nearly means solitude. And of course, solitudes are important in many fields, solitary waves and optics as well as fluid mechanics and optics is another equation that comes up a lot in all the Schrodinger equation. There's a photograph of Martin Kreskin who made some of the 